Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Week three, Tim Femi perversion. This week, we're going to save the break until later in the piece. So Tim will do a longer presentation uninterrupted, unless, of course, you have something important and very specific to what he's talking about. Save your questions. You can write them in the chat if you want to sort of register them and so you don't forget. And then towards the end, we'll stop and have five or ten minutes then come back with discussion. Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenie. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out for seminar three or seminar four, if you like. <laughs> um, all right, let's get going with the uh, first slide. Now, uh, I thought I'd start off today with these uh, four questions. Um, some of you saw the uh, Cartel Presentation Day uh, a few months ago um, might remember that I did uh, these four questions for that presentation, which is why I didn't open up the whole seminar with them because you know I wanted to keep it fresh for myself, fresh for you. But there are pretty, there are four very important questions I think to go through and and, and just see how uh, how Lacan may adjudicate one way or another on on the issues at hand here because um, it was when I started rereading seminar four earlier in the year after discussions with Russell about doing this seminar. Uh, these were these were four kind of counterintuitive things for me as somebody who knew Freud quite well um, and had, had read seminar four during my undergrad but not uh, during my PhD but not for a while not the new version. I was struck that it seemed that perversion was not the positive of neurosis for Lacan. So that's question one. Is perversion not the positive of neurosis in Lacan? Because you may have seen Freud saying something like that or heard him saying something like that. So that's question one. And they're the references in seminar four that I'm going to look at. And then you could uh, have a look at again um, after after the seminar tomorrow when you're going back over this material or never to sort of see for yourself. Because I'm going to you know, choose certain chunks of it, the, the key points that stuck out for me. but. You might want to read the paragraph before and the paragraph after each of these references to after we've been through uh, today. Here we go. Now, question two. Is perversion not a regression to a pregenital fixation in Lacan? Because you'd think it is for Freud. So is Lacan contradicting Freud again? What, what's going on here? This seems very odd. We can look at page 105, 113, and 116. Three, is fetishism a subcategory of the perversions for Lacan? Now, you might have got the sense that it is for Freud. Is it for Lacan? Maybe it'd be interesting to see what he says there and what his arguments are. And question four, is disavowal specific only to fetishism or only to perversion in Lacan? Because you would have picked up from the earlier, earlier weeks of this seminar that there is some ambiguity in Freud. Um, it seems like it is disavowal is specific to fetishism, and then suddenly it's not. And uh, and there is some uh, some uh, dispute in the Lacanian literature, with some saying disavowal is specific to fetishism and perversion is a separate structure, and others saying no, no, it is not, and it wasn't even for Lacan, or not for very long anyway. Okay, now this is just to. Uh, touch on some of the questions we wrote, we, uh, we raised last week about, um, you know, an ethics of distance, if you like, because there were always all these sort of distance metaphors going on in Lacan about how close one gets to the real, uh, not too close, not too far. Um, and what is the analytic position on this? And the analytic position cannot be anything a priori. We can't say, yes, you should do this. No, you shouldn't do that in advance without knowing the specificity of each person who comes to us with a conflict. So we have to sort of start off with a little bit of neutrality when it comes to that. Now, neurosis or perversion, which one's better? You know, is it a competition? Or as, as Freud puts it in, um, in his lecture on transference from the introductory lectures, he says, gives the example of a, of a patient, an obstinate conflict is taking place between a sensual and an ascetic trend. So a sensual trend coming from, say, the drive, an ascetic trend coming from the ego, the superego saying, no, repress, essential trend going, yes, do it. And we have this compromise. And Freud's saying, 
uh, this conflict would not be solved by our helping one of these trends to victory over its opponent. So he thinks each one is just going to reinforce the symptom. If you say, okay, well, I agree with the ascetic trend, say no. Well, that's just doubling up on the symptom. The symptom's making them suffer. How's that going to help? Or we might say, okay, well, let's just like dive in and say, let's support the sensual trend. And so, like, okay, now you're given that that's, that sensual trend tends to end up through repression as a symptom. So now you're giving it more fuel. So what I think Freud's trying to do there is just say, let's just see what the desire of the patient is, what the patient wants, and look at the specificities of each uh, case. He goes through this sort of uh, topic as well in his um, uh, The Dangers of Wild Analysis paper, where he sort of gets upset because somebody used, some GP uh, used his uh, knowledge of his theory to tell a patient to, um, oh, if you've had a divorce, just go out and have sex again. Um, even though she's really repressed and really frigid, and really neurotic, and Freud's going, "Hang on a second, well, I've got to actually see what's going on in this, uh, you know, poor person's psyche before, uh, you know, my name is just used for like a, a a total direct green light, no questions asked." So that's what I think he's trying to say there. And afterwards, he's saying after the treatment, if they decide on their own in favour of some midway position between living a full sexual life and absolute asceticism. We feel our conscience clear, whatever their choice. Um, so, of course, there are limits to that. You know, if they're going to commit criminal criminal acts, then that's going to be okay. That's that's not our idea of a midpoint position. But what he's saying is between those two positions, full sexual life and absolute abstinence, people are going to find their own kind of position within there somewhere, and we're we're just trying to help them get that position right for them rather than say, we're going to back this one in or we're going to back that one in. Um, for example, I, I read somewhere, I don't know if you, how, how true this is, but, but Deleuze and Guattari like to break up everyone who was in a relationship around them just because they were like a poster. And that's terrible. Like, you don't even know them. Like, you know, that might be that might be a good relationship. It might be good for them. Why can't just come in a priori with an ideological position without like taking the specificity of um, each individual uh, into account. And there's a point in seminar four where Lacan uses this distance metaphor really lovely when he says, in a lovely way where he says, indeed, the real is always timely in offering everything one needs when finally one has been set along the proper paths at the proper distance. And you know, we don't know what the proper distance is in advance. I can use the point that's being uh, made there. Now, if anybody knows this film on the right, um, that I've got this screenshot from. It's called Divorce Italian Style. And um, after watching this film, I finally knew what the word curnuto means because it's probably the most overused word in, in, the, uh, in the film. Um, I knew it was a bad word. Um, it was never used in my direction or anyone's direction with any like positive tone. And now because of the subtitles, I know it means cuckold. And it's all about this uh, gentleman here who tries to uh, force his wife who doesn't like um, into an affair so that he could break up with her and then fulfill his uh, desire with this young woman here. And to achieve that, he has to get her away from her father. It's set in provincial Sicily or something like that. And you think at the end here, the life, you know, everything uh, happily ever after for these two, these two uh, individuals, except her foot is stretched out as the camera pans. This is the like second last scene or seconds before the film finishes and touches the uh, toe of the sailor driving the ship who she has been uh, secretly attracting the gaze of, which was the opening slide of last week, um, which just goes to show that the um, the, curnot, the curnoteur is about to become the curnote. And, uh, and also it just got, goes to show that we don't want to just back in somebody's sensual current a priori without knowing what they're going to do with it, you know, and um, which would make us, you know, in some ways responsible, possibly for uh behavior we're not that uh, comfortable with anyway enough with our journey through uh, italian cinema which is a great way to pass time during a uh, a lockdown let's put it that way now what else going on here If you click on it, does it oh, give you a red? Yeah. There we go. It was um, my, the view had gone like horizontal, which was covering the top of the page. Now it's gone vertical again, which is uh, 
much easier to negotiate. So here we go on the next slide. Question one, is perversion the positive of neurosis for Lacan? Which is probably the, uh, positive, the classic formulation of Freud. And what's Lacan saying in seminar four? He's saying, translating in a classical way, Freud's notion that perversion is the negative of neurosis. Okay, so not the positive of neurosis, but the negative of neurosis. Is, it, is that the same thing or is that different? This was curious for me. But translating this notion, these analysts, so he's talking about his peers here and criticizing him, seek to turn perversion into something where the drive has not been elaborated. All right, so what's going on there? Others, however, Lacan continues talking about other tendencies within the field, try to show that far from being this pure element, perversion forms something that comes about via dramatic crises, fusions and diffusions of neuroses, presenting the same dimensional richness as neurosis, as the eroticization of defenses. Fine by me, says Lacan. And I think that's the clue of what he's complaining about here. It has the same dimensional richness as neurosis. The drive has, has been elaborated in perversion. So we've got to be careful with this. Perversion is the negative or perversion is the positive of neurosis. It still has been elaborated. It still has dimensional richness. That's what Lacan wants to say there. If uh, in Dan Collins's language, you'd be like, it, it still has some discontinuity with the instinct once it becomes a drive. It's tangled up and signifies, right? Um, and this eroticization of defenses, uh, I think, is a very, very kind of Batillian insight too, which is no accident because Bataille was quite influenced off um, um, parts of Freud's work. Um, the eroticization of defenses, it's like the lure of forbidden fruit, of forbidden fruit. When we put taboo on something, a taboo on something, we can also give it an erotic value by damming it up. Um, the forbidden fruit tastes finest as the saying goes. So perversion might be that moment where we, erotic, we let the taboo or the, or the repression, if you like, eroticize what's being prohibited and then reacts it at a later point in a different context when it may be safer to do so. All right, that's one example. Fine by me, says Lacan. This is certainly not taken to mean that what is hidden in the unconscious with a case of neurosis is in perversion out in the open in a state of freedom. All right. It's still structured. Now, Lacan goes on on page 113. It is astounding that people should have dreamed of maintaining that perversion is the negative of neurosis. Which is curious because that's not quite what Freud says, right? That perversion is the negative of neurosis that has not been elaborated by the Oedipal and neurotic mechanism. Okay, now there's another clue. It's not just that the drive is no longer the instinct because it's tangled up and signifies, it's that these signifiers have become tangled up in the drive during Oedipal and neurotic complexes that a subject goes through in their development, right? It's not a pure instinct. It's not just the instincts with ideations attached to it. It's an instinct with ideations attached to it, namely the drive that's been through the Oedipal and neurotic mechanism somehow, right? So that's what Lacan's saying here. And now page 243, later on in the seminar, Lacan returns to this issue and says, Freud roundly affirms that perversion is structured in relation to the absence and presence of the phallus to the castration complex on the same level as neurosis. It is structured in such a way as to be its negative, its inverse, but it is just as structured as neurosis. So that would have been one of the quotes you saw in the um, advertising material for this seminar. I thought it was a really um, good one to pluck out. So not, not only is it the drive, not just the instinct, not only is it elaborated in Oedipal and neurotic mechanisms, it's specifically linked to the presence or absence of the phallus and the castration complex, which brings it close to fetishism, right? Which is one of the questions we've got to um, look at too. So these are the sections that I'm looking at from seminar four, uh, seminar four over here on the right. Just a couple of um, uh, little scans. I took of them and stuck them up so that you can have a look while you're looking at these um, tomorrow and then get the seminar out itself and read the page before and the page after just to um, see what your interpretation of this would be. Okay. Now let's have a look at what Freud himself says on this.
Neuroses are, so to speak, says Freud, the negative of perversions. Okay, so it sounds like Lacan is misquoting Freud, right? Freud's notion that perversion is the negative of neurosis. That's not what he's saying. He's saying here in the Dora, in the Dora case, 1905, written in 1999, but published in 1905, neurosis is the negative of perversion, which is a little bit different. So if we think of it in a, in a methane form, you can see what I'm pointing to here. Neurosis is on top of the bar, perversion is beneath the bar, right? Neurosis is the negative of perversion. We can see that, for example, in the paper on negation, where Freud tells us about his patient who says, uh, yeah, I did have a dream uh, this morning, but I don't want to tell you about it because you're going to say it's about my mother, or you're all going to say it's about my father. And Freud, of course, says, yes, in this moment, we, we dismiss the symbol of negation and assume that it is about their mother and it is about the father. It's a great way to actually annoy your patient, probably you wouldn't go for that today, but um, it sort of goes to show that, that the, the negation, it's the neurosis that negates the perversion. What's being negated is maybe there's a sexual or aggressive content in this dream directed by the patient towards their mother and the father. That's the perversion. The neurosis is the negation of that saying, it's not about them. And you can even say like, can you say more about what it's not about? Because of course the neurotic has symbolized everything, they just don't own it themselves. So. Oh, yeah, you're going to say it's this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this, this, but you're wrong. And Freud might go, okay, thank you very much. And um, it's not going to be an exact fit, of course, but it's going to give some insight as to what is beneath that symbol of negation. And that's different than saying that perversion is the negation of neurosis. That would seem like you're putting, sort of down here, the perversion on top of the bar and neurosis underneath. Um, you could look at it that way. You know, it might be uh, fruitful to do that and say, well, if in a certain situation it would be good not to act out on something, then a perversion would be a negation of that, you know, more uh, proper thing to do, not act out on something that's too perverse. So maybe Lacan's doing something like that, or maybe he's responding to some of the second league literature or something like that's going on. Now, what else does Freud say down here on the bottom left? Symptoms are formed in, the, in part at the cost of abnormal sexuality. All right, uh, neuroses are, so to say, the negative of perversion. So that's back to that sort of, you know, negation is above the bar and is neurosis is above the bar because it negates what's beneath the bar, the perverse drive. Maybe he doesn't like that too much because it's going to make us think that perversion is there for some kind of pure drive, like an instinct, as if it's not mixed up in signifiers and Oedipal and neurotic mechanisms and somehow the presence or absence of the phallus. So maybe there's something like that going on too. Uh, that last one was from the three essays. Uh, now, so is this one. The clearly conscious, the clearly conscious fantasies of perverts, right? The delusional fears of paranoiacs, the unconscious fantasies of hysterics, coincide with one another, even down to the details. So it's a, a nice sweep of how, like, he tries to bring these uh, three structures together, if you like, as Freud likes to do. He'll be working on one, one issue, and then I'll say, okay, now I've got that. How would it relate to this structure or that structure or this issue or that issue? And then you'll try and roll them all together while, while he's running hot. And uh, sometimes it comes out really nicely. So to use an example, a clearly conscious fantasy of a pervert might be, I want to be beaten by uh, my father, can't be my actual father. So I'll make it a father substitute or a father surrogate. And I won't even know. It'll only slightly look like them by some superficial thing, but like I can even like disavow it in that moment to not spoil my pleasure. What's the delusional fear of paranoiac think instead? My doctor's trying to kill me. My doctor's trying to kill me and rape me. No, I'm sorry, no, I'm wrong, wrong. It's God that's trying to do that. Like just thinking of poor Schreber, right? And whereas the hysteric says like, I know you're gonna say that I wanna do that, but I don't, you're wrong, you know, like happy snaps and everything. So that can be, can be one way of rolling it all together. Right. Uh, what else does uh, Freud say down the bottom here? Uh, the neuroses contain the same tendencies, though in a state of repression, as do the positive perversions, which is what was sort of going on in my question there. Um, so, and it kind of like tallies with the kind of general impression we might have has been coming up in our discussion of um, the pervert does out in the real world what the neurotic only fantasizes about. And um, there's a quote coming up later, which I stole from um, 
I stole from the Lacan Circle Facebook site, which uh, which means I stole from Eugenie because she puts them up there, where Lacan goes back to saying something very much like this, um, but with a bit of a funny twist. So we'll have a look at that um, in a few slides. Okay, so much for question one. We now know the relation between neurosis and perversion. Ah, and here it is, the stolen quote. It's actually from Seminar 23, so it's a good get. Seminar 23 has not been uh, published uh, as yet officially. Uh, it's the seminar on the real and the symbolic and the imaginary, RSI for short. And what's Lacan say? Like 74, 75, so that's 20 years later, right? It says the perversions, such as we believe we discern them in neurosis, are not that at all. So he's saying, while there might be perverse things or traits within the neurotic, in their fantasies, in their symptoms, they're still not perverts, right? It's making a hard line here. Neurosis consists in dreaming, not perverse acts. So it's using behavior as the kind of marker of difference, right? The neurotic fantasizes or dreams about something that the pervert does out in the real world. Neurotics have none of the characteristics of pervert, perverts. Maybe he's using a bit of um, uh, hyperbole there, a bit of poetic overstatement, just to make his point, right? To show what the markers are. They simply dream of being perverts, which is quite natural. Quite, how else could they attain their partner? Okay, so what's he mean there? It seems a bit cheeky. I think he's saying in that moment, they might think, okay, that's it. I'm going to you know, stop chickening out. I'm going to go out. I'm going to try and find my partner. I'll go try and find our partner. And, you know, I'm in that moment, I'm dreaming that I'm a pervert, that I could just go and do this and then we could have all this, you know, sexual satisfaction together. But really, you know, they're, they're, they're struggling. It's a performance. It's performance. They could pull it off. They could not pull it off. Um, they could hold it for a while, but it doesn't mean they're suddenly a pervert. You know, they just, uh, you know, put it all the stops for that moment because enough was enough. And uh, hopefully for their sake, uh, had some nice success. Okay. Now, Let's have a look at what Lacan says about Freud's child is being beaten case. Freud tells us that he's focusing his study on six cases. This is from page 106 of the seminar. Six cases which are more or less obsessional neuroses. Four women and two men. So it just goes to show that somebody can have a perverse fantasy it's hard to think of anything more perverse than BDSM in a way, um, and yet not be neurotic, not be not be perverse, not be perverts, but be neurotics, right? Now, whereas says Lacan, the masturbatory practices associated with these fantasies do not entail guilt. Wording these fantasies show great difficulty, abhorrence, repugnance, and culpability. It is not the same register mentally to play with a fantasy or to speak about it. So he's saying that they could be happy to uh, masturbate over these fantasies. They could be happy to, um, yeah, which, which involves a practice, maybe take the practice even further, but doesn't mean they're happy to put it into words, right? And Lacan in Seminar 7 says something like that as well, that, um, Neurotics have great difficulties in, in, in confessing some of the phantasms. It's about putting it into words, putting it into the symbolic that, you know, that is the point of resistance. And I think, again, as I said in, at one point in the, in the first uh, week of this seminar, that's a pretty good definition of the real. It's something that we just can't put into words. Even if, we want, even if we're happy to play with a fantasy or masturbate over it, can we put it into words? No, that will entail putting it into the symbolic. How was the real defined? Often as the whole in the symbolic or what is absent in the symbolic or what fails to become articulated in the symbolic. This is especially insofar as our symbolic is made up of defensive representations based on our resistances to actually, you know, wording, getting this stuff uh, recognized or viewed by, by the other in some way. Right, so what can we conclude? The neurotic plays mentally, a negation of the perverse that plays physically, but neither can necessarily articulate what it means. Uh, it's just as structured as the fence as the other. Whether you act out or not, whether you're neurotic or perverse, it can still be a defense there, I think is the message. 
right? And I think that sort of like tallies with what Bataille says um, in eroticism when he says the essence of eroticism is silence. It's in uh, page 264 of his eroticism text. He says something like that. I looked it up. It's the wording slightly different, but that's basically what he is saying. The essence of eroticism is silence. How does one get to that place of eroticism? Through transgression of the taboo. Is it a complete overthrowing of the taboo? No, says Bataille. Transgression does not deny the taboo. It transcends it and completes it. That's part of the eroticization of defences. That's one of the definitions of per perversions. So, for example, one might be neurotic from Monday to Friday, and then one might be pervert on a Saturday night. But in a sort of way that's uh, quite structured on both sides to be opportune and controlled. If one is, you know, uh, sensible, has had luck in the upbringing, not too much trauma, um, and has some psychoanalytic know-how, perhaps. Right. Let me uh, just move that. What else does Bataille say on this issue? Often the transgression of a taboo is no less subject to rules than the taboo itself. No liberty here. So it's not as if transgression means instantly unlimited or as if the transgression is not between other limits. For example, think of this, uh, this photo here in the background of um, looks like somebody in a dungeon, right? Chained up. But, you know, they could just be holding up their hands like that and bending their knees just to give that feeling. But, you know, they're not actually hanging at all, right? It could be just a structured. Those, you know, he or she might have put those cuffs on themselves. They might not even be locked, right? It's all part and there could be safe words involved. This is actually a photo from uh, Bataille's Documents Journal of 1930, the dissident surrealist journal that really uh, um, uh, offended Breton, Andre Breton, um, because it seemed too transgressive to him. But um, yeah, it can be just as structured, just as stylized, set within other taboo, uh, within other limits, which doesn't mean that uh, don't worry, nothing to worry about. Of course, this is no uh, idealism that Bataille's got going here, right? He says, there's no absolute liberty here. What, what we're trying to say generally is at such and such a time and up to a certain point, this is permissible. That is what the transgression concedes, only up to a certain point. But once a, once a limited license has been allowed, unlimited urges towards violence may break forth. And so that's when you can still get uh, trouble, not just um, in erotic practice, but his example is um, is war. How, for example, in war, there are, there, are, there are rules to the game often. There are rules about how you treat civilians, how you treat prisoners of war. And then there are like moments throughout history ubiquitous throughout history where it's just the absolute utmost in savagery across every continent every people at some point uh you'll find things like this just uh happen and what goes on is absolutely astounding and so far beyond the limits of an ordinary person's practice um it can happen there's something in our nature there's something in the drive where if we're not careful it can get away with it get away from us which is not to say we'll every time or that we can't be careful, or that we shouldn't continue to try to be careful about getting the structures of transgression and taboo right. That's part of the eroticization of defenses. Okay, let's look at question two. Is perversion a regression to a pregenital fixation in Lacan? All right, let's have a look at page 105. What is perversion, says Lacan? The persistence of a fixation that bears on a partial drive, purported to traverse unscathed by the Oedipus complex, culminating in the genital drive, which is the ideal unifying drive. So if you know something of Lacan's critique of object relations and other traditions in psychoanalysis, you could probably get a sense that he's being a little bit sarcastic there. Let me ham up the tone a little bit. It's the persistence of a fixation that bears on a partial drive purported to traverse unscathed by Oedipus complex, culminating in the genital drive, which is the ideal unifying drive. 
the ideal unifying drive, the genital drive, as if there's a sexual relation. And the Lacan sort of, you know, dictum that there is no sexual relation is often sort of uh, uh, boils down to the fact that the genital drive is not an ideal unifying drive. Um, there's no, uh, it, it, it doesn't unify our own partial drives and finding, finding the other, a man finding a woman is certainly not going to necessarily do it either. If we don't even have an ideal hum, harmonious relationship with our own drive, right? You know, how are we going to like somehow make that work with somebody else who doesn't have it with their own drive? So it doesn't mean it's absolutely hopeless. It just means it's not an ideal, naturally harmonious, uh, easy thing, right? There's no sexual relation. There's no genital drive that completely supersedes the, the existence of the previous stages, oral and anal, um, and, or, and the aggressivities that can be involved in that, and the presence and absence of a phallus, Lacan may say, as we know from the way he treated question one. Let's read on, page 113 now. That perversion is a drive that has not been elaborated by the Oedipal and erotic mechanism. It's purported to be a pure and simple relic, the persistence of an irreducible partial drive. Okay, so he's saying something quite kind of different there. He's saying that, so yes, there's no natural sexual relation. The genital relation does not completely cancel the previous uh, partial drives. On the other hand, those partial drives aren't uncolored by the phallic and genital phase and the Oedipus stuff that comes afterwards. They are a mixture of each other. Because if you sort of look at like everyone's development along a, a kind of axis of time, they go through oral, anal, phallic, Oedipus castration, latency, and then you know, through the window over there, the um, uh, you know genital phase properly proper if you like when puberty comes along and there's a bit of education. Uh, and whenever we like uh, access our our sexuality, it's gone through it's gone through all of that. Yeah, it's like there's a trace of every single stage in every little um, uh, kind of emergence, I guess is what Lacan's trying to say. So there's a bit of like phallus in the partial drive, there's a bit of partial drives in the phallus, there's a bit of um, Oedipus in the partial drive, there's a bit of partial drive in the Oedipus. It's all kind of uh, mixed in together um, in a different sort of mixture for everyone. And even in an individual, there'll be a different kind of mixture that comes out each time, depending on the context and where they are at. Now, let's have a look at what Freud says. Because the child is being beaten is um, the, the longer title is something like, uh, from memory, a contribution to the field of the on the origin of the perversions or something. So you'd say he's going to give us a good definition of pervert of the perversions in here. And what's he say? A beating fantasy of this kind that he's talking about through his patients is a primary trait of perversion. One of the components of the sexual function something oral or something anal or something sadistic has undergone fixation withdrawn from the later process of development so that's where Lacan's peers are getting this what he calls a misreading of what's going on in perversion from it's something that Freud did say but Lacan thinks it's been taken out of proportion so there is a sense where one of the components of the sexual function has undergone a fixation but it doesn't mean there's not later phases mixed in with it and vice versa, when we as adults suddenly, you know, go there in some ways. Now, what else does Freud say about this uh, famous case, this famous paper, in this famous paper? He's talking about his female patients here. He's saying, fantasy one is my father is beating the child whom I hate. And this is all about the child wanting to be the fantasy of the child or the adult having this fantasy, recollecting it somehow is that they are the favorite one. My father is beating the child whom I, who I hate. My father is beating my brother or my sister. My father is doing that to show that I'm the favorite. But then the middle phase of the fantasy, it's like, hmm, while we've got the, uh, while we've got the ruler out, it looks a little bit phallic, doesn't it? Maybe father is going to beat me now. Maybe that's the middle fantasy, right? And that's what happens. It shifts, it shifts to, I am being beaten by my father. Right, and in the cases of uh, that Freud's dealing with in his clinic at that time, so and this could be through a rivalry towards the mother. He loves only me. He's beating me. He's uh, he's giving it to me, not my mother. I'm beating my mother, says the female patient. 
right? So what we have there is a repression of an incestuous object choice, right? It's not exactly uh, that, the, that the patient wants to be beaten, but, but penetrated, right, with the phallic object. A repression of incestuous object choice, which harks back to the pre pregenital because of the repression of the incest taboo, the libido kind of takes something from the early organization, which in this case is the sadistic anal organization. And so it's not, I'm fantasizing about my father having sex with me. Instead, I'm fantasizing about him beating me, right? So it takes on a sadistic anal organization. So what we have, says Freud, is a regressive debasement of the genital organization and a convergence of the sense of guilt and of sexual love. Not only the punishment for the forbidden genital relation, but also the regressive substitute for it, the essence of masochism. So it's a little bit like um, uh, committing a sin and confessing to it at the same time so that you can do your penance. I uh, think of the example of uh, at the end of Story of the Eye when um, Simone goes to the confessional um, in the climax of the story. It's as almost as if she was, she was going to say, forgive me, Father, I have sinned. And he goes, okay, what, what's the sin? Um, I, uh, I, um, I confess lewd stories to the priest in order to arouse him in confessional. And then I started masturbating. And then I started urinating. And the priest is like, when did you do that? She goes, I'm doing it right now. And it's like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, okay, do three Hail Marys and uh, say sorry. Okay, see ya. It's like, you know, the act is being committed, the transgression, and then it's being uh, kind of uh, punished for punished at the same time. I'm not, I'm not being penetrated. I'm being beaten for making a sinful fantasy. And in order to act, in order to do this, in this case, it regresses back to the anal sadistic phase something uh, of the pregenital, some component instinct, which has undergone fixation. So that's what Freud says is uh, going on there. Now, coming back to Lacan for a sec on page 116. Pregenital relations come into play in the Oedipal dialectic, right? From the anal to the oral, because of course, the child has no experience. Pregenital relations can more easily be apprehended in verbal representations. The italics there is uh, Lacan quoting from Freud. Pregenital relations can be more easily represented in verbal representations. The child can tell themselves more easily that what the father gives to the mother is his urine, because urine is something that the child is very inquietant with in use. So when these fantasies first formed for the child, they didn't know about what about the role of semen in fertilizing the egg. They didn't really know uh, you know exactly how penis and vagina uh, worked. Um, they're too young to know that their, their biology isn't at that level either. It doesn't really happen till till much later. So they convert it into things they do understand. Uh, we in poo, right? Which is the what they're trying to master in that early phase, before six, before five, ages of four, ages of three, as we uh, see from the um, case of little Hans. So what does Freud say in his three essays on this? Mm. This is from essay two, section five of the three essays, which is a section called the sexual researchers of childhood. And please note that this is one of the sections that was added in 1915. So it's a later edition. So while the three essays were written in 1905, there were a few chapters, I think three for memory, that were added in 1915, plus a couple of big long footnotes on, on fetishism that I mentioned last week. So that's where these two sections come from. The 1915 editions called the Sexual Researchers of Childhood, which Lacan is always mentioning when he discusses this material in Seminar 4. So how does a child develop a sadistic view of sexual intercourse? If children at this early age witness sexual intercourse between adults, they inevitably regard it as a sort of ill treatment or act of subjugation in a sadistic sense, contributes a great deal to a subsequent predisposition to a sadistic displacement of the sexual aim. Or they usually seek a solution of the mystery in some common activity concerned with the function of micturation or defecation. 
and the subsection straight after that, the typical failure of infertile sexual researchers, Freud continues. There are, however, two elements that remain undiscovered by the sexual researchers of children, the fertilizing role of semen and the existence of the female sexual orifice. The same elements, incidentally, in which the infantile organization is itself undeveloped, prepubertal, right? And for the little girl, the clitoris is still the, lead, the leading zone as she enters into the phallic phase. Although there is debate of how much vaginal awareness there is, and there are, uh, as Lacan says, certainly cases where there was even precocious uh, vaginal uh, masturbation in some uh, some little girls, but um, the exceptions will prove the general rule by their relative and frequency, as uh, the Lacan of Seminar 19 would say. Now, okay, so that's that. The sadistic misinterpretation of sexual intercourse, the classic formulation is the child walks into the door, starts crying and says like, why is daddy hurting mummy? Right? He says, bang, bang, bang. Maybe the father on top. Maybe he hears the mother crying uh, out loud. Doesn't, can't tell the difference between cries of pain or cries of pleasure. Um, maybe he sees blood on the sheets the next day. Sometimes they do. Um, they're small, they don't understand. So that's where the sadistic misinterpretation of sexual intercourse uh, can come from. It's not the only interpretation, of course, as, as you might know from the Wolfman case, he had a different experience. His experience was, geez, mum looks like she's having fun. <laughs> I, I wanna be in her position. And that's where Wolfman develops uh, all these um, obsessions and his fantasies that he envied the mother's position and he wanted to be who the mother was in that moment. Uh, but of course had great trouble um, acknowledging this this uh, fantasy because of the taboos that it transgressed in more ways than one. Now, let's turn to seminar seven a little bit because um, it's a very important uh, um, passage in there where Lacan talks about how we who have lived for a long time under Christian law no longer have any idea what the gods are. And to so that we can recall what the gods really are, we require a little ethnography, right, to recall what the gods are. Because we Christians have erased the whole sphere of the gods. Now, why is that important in this context? Why is this not just a little bit of uh, empty exoticism, just to have a break from castration this, castration that, Oedipal that, blah, 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 right, which can be a bit much after a while. Because here we have a classic scene, right, from Greek mythology, uh, showing Zeus impregnating Danae in the form of a shower of gold soon after the child Perseus was born. So as part of the origin story of one of the great kings of ancient Greek myth was a shower of gold. Twist the phrase a little bit, a golden shower. So we have right there a urinal fantasy, right? Um, to match anything little Hans could think of or any other little kid who misinterprets what parents do. So, and also we have there in these origin myths, uh, kind of uh, a pretty uh, exposed, if you like, um, uh, kind of representation of a very common um, perversion and fetish amongst adults uh, then and, and, and now. Most famously in Bataille's uh, story of the eye book, uh, an absolute uh, surrealist masterpiece and a masterpiece of erotic literature. So, and this is what, what Lacan's always talking about when he says, you know, the gods are the real, the god, these are the real gods. These are the gods that belong to the field of the real because it gives some kind of uh, staging of the polymorphous perversity of the drives as we experienced in our own infancy and as we experienced in the infancy of our development as a civilization, right? So this is why in seminar 11, Lacan says the gods belong to the field of the real. He's talking about the Greek gods here, right? It's not G-O-D, capital G, it's the gods, plural, half of whom were always feminine, right? Where it was, says Lacan, the ich, I, the subject, must come into existence. No pun intended, not necessarily anywhere, not on a Tuesday night, not while we're working, let's be sure about that. But the gods belong to the field of the real, and it's our job to try and acknowledge this or reintegrate this, at least at a knowledge level in, in, in some way, to have more mastery over the material, right? So that our symptoms aren't crippling, so that our acting, is, acting out isn't blind, uh, prone to addiction or criminality or 
you know, just sort of wretchedness or savagery. Danae is in tune because of the love of a God, says Lacan in Seminar 7. So it's also an act of love, this golden shower. For those who know the, um, the, the story of Danae and Perseus, uh, uh, Danae's father um, hadn't produced a son and wanted to know, will I ever have a son to take over the, the kingdom? And so he asked the oracle who says, Yep, your daughter will have a son, but when he grows up, he's going to kill you. And so the, the father, of, of course, locks his daughter up so that she could never uh, never bear a son, never have kids at all. And Zeus sees her, falls in love with her, and impregnates her through a golden shower. You can see a sort of similarity, but, like, but much more veiling going on when you look at the sort of uh, uh, creation myth of Jesus. You know, God had sex with Mary, impregnated her, but never touched her because it's the Christian tradition. So there's... Not only is there no semen or, or no no nothing pre-genital, not not even anything genital. Everything is completely veiled. Where in the in the Greek myths, because they're the real gods, sometimes they would even change into animals to have sex with the um, with the woman they fall in love with, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. These are the real gods. That's what Lacan means. Perseus goes on to find the Medusa head, the very image of castration, castration fright as well. So knows maybe we could work that in somehow as well but let's take a break from ethnography and finish the final two questions of the four that we started off with is fetishism not a subcategory of the perversions for Lacan and look at 185 and 186 good one to look at tomorrow if you're looking for a Good, just two pages to spend a whole half hour on. Page 243 and 143, when I found it a little bit later on. Let's do that one first. Have a look. Is fetishism a subcategory of the perversions for Lacan? I've put in brackets here, yes, because I reckon this quote suggests it is. He says, seeing where it is, it being the phallus, and where it is not, the classification of the perversions as a whole must accomplish this as a whole, big statement. What is essential is the relation to the phallus. All the perversions can be placed within this measure, as is, as is the case in the perversion of all perversions known as fetishism. The crucial stage stands just before the Oedipus complex. So there we have, I think, a direct quote to clarify all our confusions. Um, or at least we know what Lacan thinks, whether we um, are confused about why he thinks that um, or not it still, still can be an open question but we know that he does think you know like Freud that fetishism is a distinctive subcategory of perversion it's the perversion of all perversion so we're saying that through fetishism we can get a kind of insight it's a kind of lens into what's going on in all the perversions perversions as a whole all the perversions right so I underlined that so, but that does leave the problem of why is he linking all perversions to the phallus? That stage, the phallic stage that stands just before the Oedipus complex, all right? And as we've been saying, it's pre-Oedipal, but not pre-phallic. Involves the genitals, but not in the procreative form. Child doesn't know about that yet. And the Oedipal stuff later gets mixed in too. So, but the nodal point is the question of the phallus in the perversions all the perversions, all right? What does it say on page 185? This is like only a page earlier. Nothing is conceivable in the phenomenology of the perversions if you don't start with the idea that what is involved is the phallus. And I've seen how the child realizes that the all powerful mother is fundamentally in want of something. So it's a bit of a different inflection than what you get from Freud. From Freud, it's sort of about the boy discovering the Medusa head and go, ah, there's no phallus there. Does it mean I could lose mine, right? Um, the problem with that story, um, it's not that it's not part of the story, it's that it's not complete. The problem with that is it leaves out the little girl's experience. But we know from other cases that she can develop penicillin. But what Lacan's doing here is saying, and then that little girl grows up to being to being a mother and the mother's penicillin is what causes the child's uh, fetishism, 
or the child's castration complex or the child's perversion. That's what Lacan's trying to do. So he's just taking it back a notch to include the role of the mother, um, by also including the role of the little girl in the idea of fetishism. What's he say on page 243? So this is later on in the seminar. Uh, he says, from the three essays, the 1915 session, uh, section, take note, what are broadly called perversions are conceived of in relation to the childhood theory of the phallic mother passing through the castration complex. So he's saying that in Freud's later addition to the three essays, this, this element is there. So Lacan's taking something from Freud and saying, let's emphasize this, it's important, it's being neglected. Um, let's emphasize this to get a more complete picture of not just the castration complex, but how this can lead to, um, uh, to the perversions. Right. I also think Seminar 4 would make a great bookmark if anyone wants to uh, put that idea into, into a practice. You just make it, make it thinner and there you go. Just slot right in your book. Now, let's have a look at the final question. Question 4. Is this a vowel specific only to fetishism and perversion in Lacan? Now, a problem that actualizes the question of the object in an especially keen fashion, namely the fetishes. The perversion that has taken on the role of exemplum in analytic theory. This is about fetishism. Right, so this is how he starts uh, page 143. A section in page 143. The fetish is a perversion that has taken on the role of exemplum. Right. So if a fetish is marked by disavowal, then it would mean that perversion is marked by disavowal, which is what the Fink line is. Perversion as a structure is based on the mechanism of disavowal rather than repression, which belongs to neurosis, or foreclosure, which belongs to psychosis. All right. Now, what's he say on page 148, 149? This is actually the only uh, the only point in the whole of seminar four, however, where Lacan mentions disavowal and give the German word for Leugnung, unless the in index is wrong. There's only one reference in the index and from my reread, quick skim of some of the parts, admittedly, that was the only one I found as well. So if it's so important, why is it only mentioned once? There can also be a line of criticism of this position. What's Lacan say? The notorious splitting of the ego when the fetish is involved here, woman's castration is at once affirmed, yet denied. Since the fetish is there, she has not lost the phallus. Freud speaks of verleugnung with the fundamental stance of disavowing in the relationship to the fetish. The perverse structure as such is about metonymy, the symbolic element that fixes down the fetish and projects it onto the veil. So we've got spinning of the ego, disavowal, fetish, based on the lost phallus, which is linked to the perverse structure. And metonymy, something that stands in for the absence. So it would seem that the answer is yes, disavowal is specific to fetishism and perversion in Lacan, based on this, this important passage here. Now what's, Lacan, what's Freud say in these three essays? 1915, later edition, essay two, section five, Seen in edition seven, page 195, that Lacan's talking about over here on the bottom left. He says, the substitutes for this penis, which they feel is missing in women, play a great part in determining the form taken by, not the fetishes, the perversions. So Lacan is drawing out something that is there in Freud's later edition to three essays. He could have said the fetishes there, but he didn't, he said the perversions, right? as if all perversions are somehow linked to the presence or absence of the maternal phallus. Big call, it's not one I expected to find when I first started rereading the seminar to give this seminar. So I think that's interesting. And then what's the later Freud say, 1938, the post, one of the posthumous papers, the ones he wrote while he was in London, uh, outline of psychoanalysis. He says, fetishism may be counted as one of the perversions 
So this is the idea that fetishism is a subcategory. It's one among many. It must not be thought that fetishism presents an exceptional case as regards the splitting of the ego, however. It is merely a particularly favourable subject for studying the question. Disavowals of this kind, however, occur very often, and not only with fetishists. But what he's saying is that when it does occur in fetishists, we get a clear understanding of how this mechanism works. It's like a crystallization of it or amplification of it. So you want to understand disavow? Have a look at fetishists. They're not the only ones who disavow, but they're a really good example of it. It's really immediately close to the maternal phallus, where other patients may be using disavow for something else. And the, the patients that Freud goes on to talk about are a couple of obsessional patients um, who I think were both avowing and disavowing the death of their father or something like that. So the, the, the loss, not, not so much of a maternal phallus, but of some family member, someone close to them. They were both acknowledging that they were gone, but also acting very as, as if they weren't in order to achieve trissons in certain ways or in order to avoid anxiety in certain ways. Um, so, yeah, which I think is a very interesting phenomenon. And we know as well the way fetishism is used in uh, discussions about politics, uh, probably most famously recently by or of late, or in recent times by Zizek. Uh, one example I remember reading um, him saying was, um, uh, I know very well that, you know, that climate change is real and we're destroying the environment and not enough action is being taken and hasn't been taken for a long time. Um, however, when I wake up in the morning and see a nice sunny spring day and the birds are chirping, I continue to go out and, and act as if everything's fine, regardless, single-use plastics, you know, chuck a bag of Maccas out the window, uh, vote, vote conservatives, who cares? You know, I know very well, you know, act as if I don't regardless. So fetishism can, or the mechanism of disavow can work in a number of different places. Um, and what Freud's saying and what Lacan's saying, I think, is that when it comes to the actual sexual fetishist, uh, where it's directly linked to the maternal phallus, we see the origin of this mechanism, or we see the mechanism in its clearest form. Yeah, so I think that's what's being said there. Now, it is on the hour. I said I was going to go for a bit longer, but I feel like I need to just rest my cheeks a little bit. Uh, it's a lot of talking, especially in lockdown. This is the first time I've used my voice all day, which often happens. So You're out of uh, practice. So shall we have a break now, do you think? Yeah, five, yeah I, I think so, because I've just finished the four questions too, and it's like, happened to be right in the hour, so maybe we'll do it how we're You're the one it. that needs to be in good form, Tim. Good. Okay. Let's come back at five past eight or in six minutes from now. Uh, ten minutes? Isn't it on the hour? Ten minutes. Yeah, so ten, ten minutes past cool. eight. So ten past eight, eleven minutes from now. Great. Okay. Uh, as I was just saying off here a second ago, um, I'll go through a couple of more slides. Um, this is the only one that um, has any kind of density about it. And uh, then we'll uh, do a discussion. That way we can still uh, finish with a discussion, which is good because um, basically I have to write next week's seminar starting tomorrow morning. And it's good if the last thing on my mind is all the different trains of thought that came out during the discussion, because then I could... Uh, you know, transfer them straight onto the um, first few slides and then sort of create a segue from there from what else I've already got ready to go and um, might be a nicely harmonious way to work. Now, a lot seems to hinge on this castration complex, right? So I thought I would just um, go through a slide on that on the castration complex just to see what it's what it's all about because um, it's not anything that you learn about at school it's not anything you um, hear much about or at all in the culture industry or the media or in movies and television and the newspaper um, in academic psychoanalysis uh, for example, the female side of it, Penis Night, has been completely almost watered down as persona non grata, too controversial, don't touch it. 
Um, you might hear a little bit of uh, castration anxiety in men sometimes, but that, that's about it. Um, so, uh, you know, it's like uh, I, had to, I had to draw the seminar <laughs> where it comes up almost every page, just my luck. Um, but that's the challenge. Also, to try and understand why did Lacan want to focus on it so much in seminar four, right? He, it's it kind of been kind of been any more fun for him than it is for us t today. Um, so there must have been a reason why I wanted to focus on the castration complex, and in particular, um, the untranslatable uh, penis night. We mention it in the German just to create a bit of difference. All right, now let's have a look at what Freud says in the little Hans case. Now, this actually uh, answered a, a question I had about like. Freud's articulation of the castration complex, that it sounded like, what, what, you know, who are all these people that threaten their kids that they're going to cut cut their little boy's penis off when they find them masturbating? I've never heard that once. Uh, how common is it? Like, uh, am I the only person who never heard it? Um, does hardly anyone hear it? Um, was it really common in Vienna or in Freud's time, but now it's not? Um, you know. If you don't hear this actual threat, does that mean there's no castration complex and no uh, penis night? Uh, and as I was rereading Little Huns this year, I found uh, uh, page eight, uh, standard edition 10, Freud saying about the castration complex, as if I hear you, Tim, you know, 100 years later, wherever you are. There is difficulty in inscribing castration complex's origin to a chance threat which is not of such universal occurrence. So he's answering my question. Even his time, it's not as if every little boy got told that. It's just sometimes they get told that, right? And particularly the cases, some of the cases he was dealing with. However, says Freud, even if a child does not hear that specific threat, a ch children can construct this danger for themselves out of the slightest of hints, which will never be wanting. So what's he talking about there, right? So the threat of castration can be made literally to the child sometimes, which happened, for example, with Hans's mother. Hans's mother said, I'll cut it off if I catch you doing that again or too much. Right, or I'll get your father to cut it off or I'll get the doctor to cut it off to the three that Freud mentions elsewhere. But even if the threat is not made directly, it can be suggested or implied by the initial discovery of difference. So the child doesn't necessarily need the help of the parent's threat to think that that's happened uh, themselves. The boy sees a girl or the mother and says, oh, someone's taken it. The girl sees the boy or the father and says, or the mother and says, well, so mine will never grow big. What happened to it? Who took it? This is what uh, Freud is saying is the common misinterpretation of the discovery difference in little kids, right? There's also for Freud, and this is what he says in a footnote to Little Hans, a 1923 footnote, so it's later, the castration complex is not reducible, reversible, or inflatable to earlier phallic-looking separations of birth, breast, feces. It's a reference to uh, Lou Salome's, uh, some of her um, um, positions, but also who was the birth trauma guy? Otto, Otto Rank, I think. Um, where he said the prototype of castration anxiety is birth, the separation of birth. And then you can add to that the, the weaning, the separation of weaning. And then also the separation of being made to do party, right? The separation of the of the of fecal object. And uh, Freud, he, he wants to resist this. He says, no, because while those things can be um, tough, um, they're not specifically uh, referencing the genital of the child in its phallic phase. Um, that's when it becomes significant because of the huge amount of narcissism that nature basically invests in that organ. Uh, if we grew up as a species, as little kids, uh, not giving a shit if we got kicked in the nuts or kicked in the groin or, or bitten there by an animal, then there'd be no species, right? This is like this kind of, you know, the metaphor is the crown jewels. It's not the crown jewels that's there. It's the, uh, the parts that are needed to pass on the genes and help the species survive. And it's linked, no coincidence, fortuitousness of, uh, of evolution to the most intense experience of pleasure we can ever have. And that's where the narcissism comes from. And that's why we're concerned for it more so than we are for other separations. Right? I think that's the picture that we get from Freud. All right. 
Why is it so important? Why else might it be so important? The presence or absence of the fellas. Now, imagine when we were a little kid again, right? Not only don't we know about the role of the penis and the vagina, the role of the sperm and the egg, um, we don't even know about sex or the procreative form of the act. Um, also, size can be very important for us because we are ourselves small. When we're small, we're vulnerable. We are a very, very, very vulnerable uh, newborn, very vulnerable neo neophyte. We are absolutely helpless without the primary care of the mother, right? Um, in most cases. So if you're watching a sort of nature documentary and you see the, the, the new mammal being born and it's taken those first few tentative st steps with its bambi shaky legs, right? And you're thinking, oh, geez, that's, that looks so vulnerable. And it's like, okay, You've finished your practice, good now. Time to run with the herd. We've got to make it to the next watering hole by sunset or else we'll die here. We'll get eaten by the lions. Who will be trying to kill us on the way? So hope you've had your practice, start running. That seems extreme, but we couldn't even get that far. We couldn't, we, we can't even walk until we're one or something. Um, so we are a very, very vulnerable uh, newborn. We are small. So size is a big deal for us, right? In general, we are small. We are governed and threatened by big adults as well as other animals or other threats big car big horse and cart right you know somebody can take a hit from a from a horse if they're an adult better than they can if they're a little kid we get flattened and we are promised by the big who govern us right sometimes well and sometimes not that we will grow big with time right so that's just an assumption everything grows big with time one day we'll be bigger you can learn this when you're older you can do this when you're older we'll be less threatened when we're older because we'll grow Right, so we assume everything's going to grow. That can be the mistake when it comes to the to the phallic phase in the phallic phase, and of course, which is the most intense instrument of pleasure, which has just emerged. As Lacan puts it in Little Hunter's case, it moves suddenly. It moves. There's blood flow. There's tingling. It moves. This is a real serious thing to integrate. It's the best toy a little kid's ever going to get in a way, and there are all these restrictions that are being put in it straight away for obvious. Uh, developmental reasons and it's very challenging for them right they're trying to integrate it the greed avarice narcissism envy coveting anxiety of loss may easily set in because little humans are little animals as well you know they want more they, you know the first thing they learn to say almost is it's not fair i initially had a, a big photo here of a of a, a little a little girl like hugging a, a, um, a statue of a big ice cream in a I don't know, it's at a theme park or something. So you go, oh, the biggest ice cream of all is twice the size as me. You know, that's how kids think sometimes, you know. If something gives them pleasure, they want more. They want the biggest, they want the best. And if someone else looks like they've got a bigger one, they're pissed, right? So that's the sort of mentality that we're talking about with little kids. Now, Lacan also talks about a lack of symbolizing material. And this is in the uh, seminar three, those two chapters towards the end on um, the hysterics question. Uh, what is the hysteric or the hysterics question what is a woman um two very good chapters on the hysterics question on the hysterics discourse that incur in, in, in a seminar on psychosis but um you know for good reason um and freud is also noting that the vagina is yet to become their leading erogenous zone so what it looks as if there is for the little boy and the little girl is two phalluses right it just seems like one's once is bigger than the other and that's not fair or it seems like, well, someone must have taken theirs. That means if I'm not careful, somebody could take mine. That's the mistake little kids uh, can form, right? What does Lacan say in Seminar 3? On one point, the symbolic lacks the material, for it does require material. The female sect is characterized by an absence, a void, a whole. And thus it happens to be less desirable than is the male sex for what he has that is provocative. Thus an essential dissymmetry appears. Now, it's not what we may think as adults. It's certainly not what I think, that one uh, genital is better or superior than the other. But these little kids, um, what did they think? And also, how well did their parents process this, right? What kind of attitudes are being passed on uh, to the little kids, which help kind of preserve these uh, the negative aspects of the castration complex? That's what we're talking about here. When he talks about the symbolic lacks the material, is just saying that um, because the clitoris is the leading zone and it's the only thing that visi it's visible, just like the, the penis, they think they're the same. They think there's two phalluses rather than uh, a small penis and a small vagina, right? 
plus everything else that's there. Um, yeah, okay. So the little kid still believes in quantity over quality while well, they're still young and learning about difference. Now, is there something though in the, in the attitudes of the parents that are being passed on culturally that are making this uh, worse? I think we've got to, again, do a little ethnography, right? To recollect what the gods are, not so we can be expert mythographers, but to recollect that different cultures before Christianity and before Platonism had a way of affirming and diifying these sort of earlier experiences, the genitals and the genital difference in particular, which was later lost by our Christian Platonic turn in religion, right? Note the lack of feminine deification in Christian Platonic cultures and also the lack of sexual deification generally. Okay, so there's no hero, there's no Persephone, there's no Aphrodite, there's no river nymphs and ocean nymphs and sea nymphs and forest nymphs, there's no Dionysus and his maenads, and there's no Pan Hellenic Eleusinian mysteries, right? There's no uh, Persephone and Demeter story that stops the nation. There were two things that stopped the nation in ancient Greece. They stopped all the little uh, city states from fighting. One was the Olympics and the other was the Eleusinian mysteries. So that's the sort of sacred significance that was held to the young girls um, uh, maturing and initiation. Uh, incredible amount of uh, respect and sacredness attached to that, right? It's Erwin Road who mentioned him, Erwin Road who mentions this, that uh, it was one of the few Panhellenic uh, events, the Eleusinian Mysteries, the story of Persephone and Demeter, of Persephone's return and passing away down to Hades and back. There we have uh, actually a Minoan image of uh, what is what is uh, possibly a, a pomegranate there with the pomegranate, which is one of the which is the significant uh, uh, kind of signifier, if you like, of the um, of the Persephone story. We have a representation of the female genital, so the little girl can see that. Right, as, and while she's growing up, and say, so, you know, we do exist in the symbolic. Our difference is recognized and deified. It's not uh, completely absent. I'm not left with something that's just not that, right? I have something that is its own thing, has its own presence. It's different, it's sacred. So there's a difference there, right? Genital worship was also uh, common as in the pre Christian pre Platonic religions. That's something that we lost. And we actually, you know, we think from our vantage point, even if we're, you know, we're secular and we're enlightenment, we think it's to our we think it's to our credit that we took the genitals away out of religion. Right? We think that's that's how we're better. But you know, did we lose the ability to affirm what we are and affirm difference by doing that? That's an issue. The thing to look at as a source for this. As Lacan says, is the book by Erwin Road, Psyche. And this is what he says in Seminar 7. Erwin Road, I went and looked up his Psyche recently to bring together classical antiquities, different conceptions of the immortality of the soul. It's an admirable work, which I strongly recommend. 20 pages later, he says, a work that psychoanalysts ought to have read at least once. So if you're a psychoanalyst, or you want to be a psychoanalyst, or you're interested in psychoanalysis, reading it once isn't enough. So if you haven't read it once yet, get started. Or read online, it's a great one. Two volumes, and uh, you can't go wrong. Right. What else does Rode say in this book? Rode notes that the promise of a blessed afterlife was part of the Pan-Hellenic Eleusinian mysteries, but not in the manner of the Orphism, which influenced Pythagoras and later Plato. Because remember, Plato is a proto-Christian, right? Plato is, uh, well, Christianity is Platonism for the masses, as, as Nietzsche calls it, because it changes what religion means, gets this dual structure going, where the spirit is pure spirit, desexualized, degenitalized, of course, and, you know, earth, matter, and body are fallen from the sacred object, the good, right? The God of the good up there, just one God after a while. Once you get to Christianity, especially, but even though there was a there was an afterlife aspect to the Lucinian mysteries, you could get favor in Hades. You know, you're still in Hades, right? And it's not the same as what Plato and the Christians later did. Plato drawing from Orphism and Pythagoras, because says Rode, 
the Eleusinian mysteries contain no strange reevaluation of values contradicting the general opinions of the time and no view of the beyond that made this earth seem dark and mean and death superior to life. Because when you get to Plato and Socrates and then the Christianity, death is superior to life. It's like life is just a trial where you suffer so that you get happiness in the afterlife. And what does the afterlife mean? Living altogether without a body was how Plato put it and Plato and Socrates put it. Uh, in the photo, life is about practicing your asceticism, denying the body so that when you die, you can be a pure soul already because you've already, you know, eschewed the evil body and its drives your whole life and it can float up as a pure immortal soul and live without a body for good. The fundamental fantasy of metaphysics, right? To live without a body. It's there in the beginning of Plato. And that kind of comes back to this in seminar, right? This myth of metempsychosis, the reincarnation of souls, is there in the margins of all of Plato's dialogues, right? But this is a kind of foreign move, if you like. It's a foreign move within uh, Greek culture. Look at the contrast of what Plato says to what Achilles says in Homer. We know Odysseus goes down to the underworld. Um, he sees Achilles there and he thinks to, to, to flatter him and says, ah, Achilles, even in the land of shades, you still look, you still look more, most lordly among men. And Achilles says, don't try to prettify death for me, noble Odysseus. I'd rather serve as farmhand to the poorest peasant than lord it over all these wasted dead. So that is the classic, classical Homeric or Greek religious position. Uh, after death comes nothing hoped for nor imagined, as Heraclitus puts it. It's all about an affirmation of what we have here, the earth, the body, nature, right? There's a massive shift in the center of gravity that occurs after that with Plato and Christianity, as Lacan puts it, that massive shift of the center of gravity. You even see it at the end of um, Iphigenia, or Iphigenia, as I think it's said in, uh, in the Anglophone world. In her final words before she's about to be sacrificed by Agamemnon or by Agamemnon's priests to stir the becalmed fleet bound for Troy is to gaze into the light is the sweetest thing for mortals because after death is nothingness. There's nothing better to come, so it's all about affirming now. That was the sort of general tenor of the times, and this is what changed with Orphism, which influenced Pythagoras and later Plato and then became the sovereign good and the Christianity by the time he got to the late Roman Empire, Constantine, Theodosius, then the Dark Ages, right? You should be hoping for death. There's something better if you're living in the Dark Ages. Now, the Nietzschean tinge in what Erwin Road is saying here, the reevaluation of values, is of course no accident. As some of you may know, if you're across your classical scholarship or your Nietzsche scholarship, Rode and Nietzsche both became classics professors under Friedrich Ritschel at Bonn and Leipzig and remained for a time close thereafter. So they were mates. They studied together under the same classics professor and became classics professors themselves. In fact, when Nietzsche um, received a copy of Rhodes, uh, Rhodes's book, Psyche, he said, like, your work is like mine with, with an army of footnotes around it acting as a citadel. And that's the difference. Like Nietzsche is a sort of fluent writer. Not everything is like referencing the various positions in the, in the, in the scholarly literature. That's what Rode does. Rode is like Nietzsche with all the missing footnotes. But in some ways, the positions or the insights are quite similar. And you know, the experience of, of every undergrad coming to university is often uh, you want to read Nietzsche because he's like, you know, so much fun to read, but you have to write about him like Road because you've got to learn the science of scholarship, you know, reviewing the literature, meta analysis, sourcing, clarifying the argument. So, yeah, that's like two sides of a coin in a way. Now, E.R. Dodds, another uh, classical scholar from maybe the 20th century, I think, possibly uh, uh, Irish, British um, in origin. Uh, he agrees with Rode and Nietzsche that Orphism turned pre-existing pre beliefs about the soul into a Puritan psychology and that Plato was influenced to adopt his transcendental psychology through his personal contact with the Pythagoreans of West Greece when he visited them in about 390 BC. That is after the decline of a classical period. Because no, the classical period ends around 400 BC 
with the end of the, um, of the Civil War, when Athens lost the Civil War to Sparta. The classical period is 600 BC to 400 BC. Is that 200 years, which is often known as the Golden Age, what Lacan in Seminar 8 calls that fertile moment of Hellenism, that spectacular intellectual climax um, that the Renaissance, for instance, tried to, tried to bring back um, to end the Dark Ages, which eventually turned into our Enlightenment, right? Our modern Enlightenment, which E.I. Dodds calls the second attempt at Enlightenment in the West. The first one being classical Greece. Second one, ours, the modern one, being a second attempt. And E.I. Dodds kind of warns us that Neither of them led to an age of pure reason. We know the first one didn't, went through the Dark Ages. And I think you've got to be a pretty uh, uh, recalcitrant positivist to still think that it's, you know, on the horizon for us today. It doesn't seem like we're entering into an age of reason even today because people regress, right? They get stressed, there are stresses, they go back to irrationality. And that's what basically is Dodds' thesis in his book, The Greeks and the Irrational. He says the disaster of the civil war Right, is what let Plato come in and say, okay, to fix all this corruption, what we need to do is change religion and the metaphysical structure to make it against the body, against desire, set up a pure a Puritan psychology. That would fix us. It didn't fix us, right? But it's a mistake we always fall into. And it's a mistake that has consequences at the level of a child's sexual development because one of the ways to reinforce a repressive sexual morality is to deny the existence of certain aspects of our drives and those aspects become the real. It's a typical sort of process. One way to deny your temptation is to deny your object of temptation. And that's how the real is even constituted as that which fails to become articulated. And this can also play out in our discovery of sexual difference. We're not being born into a culture or thrown into a culture in the to a symbolic, which is easily able to articulate uh, or incorporate the real. In fact, the symbolic is defined precisely as that which leaves out the real. And there are like historical reasons for this. And that's what I'm trying to uh, bring out here. Now, last slide and a couple of like uh, lighter moments. How does disavow work? How are we able to see one thing as another? Did you see a dog here on the left or a man running into the snow? Right? This is Wittgenstein's famous duck rabbit. Did you see a duck here? A duck looking at the dog or the man? Or do you see a rabbit looking at this uh, um, Christian statue, I think, here? Right? This Christian statue, is it like of the Virgin Mary in her ascension? Did you see a nun in her habit spreading her arms? Or did you see a vagina? I find it hard not to see that as a vagina, but I could sort of see that maybe the sculptor was trying for, for the um, the Blessed Virgin's ascension to heaven. Um, the duck and the rabbit, I can see both. The dog and the man, I can see both. And that's what Wittgenstein's uh, trying to talk about with these, what he calls ambiguous figures. Seeing as, we can see this figure as a duck or as a rabbit by noticing an aspect or noticing a different one, an alternating aspect, imaginative seeing, interpretive seeing, gestalt shift. So that's what can happen when the child experiences sexual difference as something traumatic, perhaps um, you know, picking up uh, negative attitudes and the lack of a sexual relation between its parents, between the parents, between the, each other, and also in their own relation to their own um, sexuality. They have this fright, so they see it as something else. And that's what creates the real as something not articulated. And it's also what creates the fetish objects. So what becomes uh, seemingly uh, removed from the symbolic is the existence of the female sex, perhaps more than it needs to be, I guess. I don't want to like leave us with these castration complexes as if there's never a way out, because what's the point of analysis if all we're doing is reinforcing pathological states? We want to try see if we can step through them and make it out. Okay, I'll stop there. And uh, we've got a few minutes left, we've got 20 minutes left, so maybe we can um, uh, we can see how you're all going and um, see if we can get a discussion going and um, set me up for uh, working on next week's seminar so I know what will be good to um, focus on.
was amazing, Tim, and so dense. Um, there's a lot of stuff there. It's really, it's, it's just amazing that you can do all that in that period of time. And um, it's hard to take everything in. Um, Bill has his hand raised. Please raise your hand, guys. hands, guys, if you want to get in the queue, but I'm going to ask a question first. I have gone back to almost where you began, uh, the three stages that Freud describes in his analysis of the child is being beaten fantasy. Mm -hmm. I, I think I really just want to reprise. Can you just give us a little synopsis of what he's getting at and what the move is in each stage of that process. Okay. Um, let me see if I can, maybe I won't get the, sli the slide back up. I'll just do it verbally. We can rely on Bill's backdrop. Okay. Yes. So, um, so stage one is, uh, the patient, um, uh, if it's a female, if it's the female, typical female patient or for its female patients at the time, it's uh, my father is beating a child. A child is being beaten by my father, a child who's not me, I'm just watching or I'm just reporting that I saw or I saw someone beating the child. And then through further analysis, the beater ends up being the father and the child being beaten is maybe a, a rival, a sibling through sibling rivalry. Um, and it's about uh, the child's fantasy to be the father's favourite. Or if it was a boy boy patient, Freud then does the inverse and looks at his uh, male patients who have these, this uh, masochistic fantasy. Uh, it's the mother or, or a substitute for the mother that's doing the beating of a child. That's, that's stage one of the fantasy, uh, first stage. Then he talks about the middle stage where the object of the beating is not a rival child, but the patient themselves. My father is beating me or my mother is beating me right and he's saying that this is more conscious in his male patients they're able to consciously articulate this uh, fantasy much easier than his female patients are who are a bit more sketchy about uh, the middle phase so it takes more working through the material to kind of get there which may be um, from cultural reasons um, or other reasons, or might just be, you know, the small sample size Freud had to deal with, which I think was, I don't know, it was four males and two, four females and two males or something like that, right? Early days of psychoanalysis. And what he's saying is going on. Uh, the third stage, I didn't mention the third stage, so I didn't think it was that uh, critical for what we were discussing, but it was, I just get Bill to move to the left or the right. No, it was... Um, uh, the spectator. What was the feel? I think it was just uh, someone was beating someone, and uh, and um, the patient was just observing neutrally. It's like somebody who visited a BDS and BDS and M club but didn't participate, just watched, and was aroused. So it sort of like uh, separates from you know the self uh, from memory. But the, the key part is the middle middle part because the beating is uh, is a metaphor for the act of being uh, penetrated by the phallus. And if it's the mother that's doing the beating on the son, it's being beating, uh, penetrated by the maternal phallus, right? So it involves the uh, fetishistic disavowal, whereas for the female patient, uh, maybe not so much or not so, not so directly. There might be fetishistic disavowal in the initial relation with the mother, but in that moment, it's just my father is beating me because um, uh, I have to hide the fact that it's an incestual, uh, incestual wish to be penetrated by my father. So the t incest taboo comes in, so it transfers from uh, sex to punishment. And it does that by regressing from the genital phase to the, anal, the anal, earlier anal sadistic phase, the partial drives. And it does that because that phase is, is always uh, present for these patients in particular because there's been a fixation along the way. There may have been some primal scene or they'll witness to something. Um, that's why I went into that stuff about the sadistic misinterpretation of, of sex. When the parents leave the door open because they think, oh, the child's too young, they're not going to know, know what they see or I need to keep an eye on them if they wake up. And they do wake up and they do see something and they can only half imagine what's going on there. So this can lead to a predisposition where someone is suddenly, uh, you know, in adult life, finds out that they're quite aroused by that. 
if it's just experienced as a fantasy, it could be a neurotic patient. If they're actually from a BDSM community and they're acting it out, it's uh, they could have a perverse, more of a perverse structure. Uh, yeah, how was that? Mm, that was great. I I noticed that you're allowing for these turns and morphings and re referrals to earlier stages in the initial um, elucidation of the fantasy or the progression through the stages of the fantasy. But you you posit it as arriving in adulthood as say a perversion or the the activity that the adult might you know be participating in as a direct reference to that earlier experience or fantasy but it could be just as loose in adulthood mm. couldn't it yes so it's, it could be participating in all the all the initial experiences and all those references reference behind the initial experience it's just as difficult to pin down is yeah, that so okay. do you think that's so I think so, yeah, because that, that's the sort of when Freud talks about how, um, you know, the overvaluation of the object or the degree of fetishism that's in everyone, whether they're an actual fetishist or not. And I use the sort of uh, example of the, um, uh, while somebody with ordinary fetishism, or ordinary perversion might, you know, enjoy the act of strip tease from their partner, she takes the stocking off. But the fetishist, the actual fetishist is the one who like pushes the lady inside, grabs the stocking and runs off with it because the four element becomes the whole thing, for example. But yeah, especially in adults and especially after one becomes psychologically informed, it's like, well, as part of an eroticism, you know, it's these are all the tools we have to play with. Yeah, we don't, we don't have to be fixated on them, um, but uh, we know how it all works in an erotic sense. You can view a documentary on BDS and M and say it's never really been my personal thing, but I, I get it. I can see when it's done well and, and, and like it. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it was my initial fixation or your initial fixation or the people in the video's initial fixation. In some cases, yes. In some cases, maybe not. Could just be play. Thank you, Tim. Bill. Oh, thanks, Eugenie, and thank you, Tim, for uh, an, another great uh, lecture that was fantastic. I just wanted to ask a follow on question from Eugenie's and it's about uh, a child is being beaten as well. And particularly that middle category that seems absolutely critical, which is the um, focus on um, masochism as, a, as the sort of telltale um, template, I guess, for perversion. Um, and what seems to be for its focus, and it surprised me because I was expecting, I guess, a kind of Lacanese there that, you know, the, the sort of, even though I know this, I do that, or that kind of doubleness that goes on with perversion. Freud used uh, a very specific term, which he said it's guilt hmm. that actually creates masochism or is the is absolutely critical in transforming the pregenital sadism into a masochism and guilt to me sounds like a classic judeo-christian value and very much at odds with you know the the kind of um glib view of uh the fetishist you know who's uh, the happy chappy enjoying his golden showers or whatever from the from the, essentially the pagan gods and I'm just wondering what's what happens from Freud to Lacan uh, and why does masochism seem to go on walkabout with this quality of guilt and fetishism moves to the fore you know with this notion of doubleness and disavowal yeah I think guilt is what guilt is because there's an it's because there's something genital uh that's initiating this beating fantasy uh, i am being beaten by my father is uh i am being penetrated by my father or penetrated by my mother guilt comes because it's a violation of the incest taboo right and because of that guilt it uh backflows to the pregenital point which is anal uh anal sadism 
and the child then gets to be punished for their sinful wish to be penetrated to have sex with the father or the mother while also having the sinful wish metaphorized right. the beating is just is you know is the penetration so it's kind of like a comp so there is that sort of double there yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that's right. a complex frozen in time yeah so you can look you know watch those bdsnm acts and sort of say well, why why are they getting going off in this but then you can see the beating as a metaphor for the sexual act you know the sadistic misinterpretation of the act and say okay that makes sense now because it doesn't actually hurt like you can grab one of those whips from the sex shop and hit your arm as hard as you can like really wind up and it's like they're just designed to make a really loud cool noise it's like clicking your fingers it's like your head's just as little as clicking your fingers right but it's there to get that sort of play acting that get that metaphorization happening the uh, the act and the punishment for the act all in one so it's nicely coded so that um so that the guilt is uh not uh experienced directly it's paid for i paid for my sins by being beaten yeah thanks penelope Yes, thank you very much. I'm, I'm not only learning and understanding all sorts of things, but I'm also um, laughing a lot, <laughs> um, especially today. So thanks for that. Um, also laughing at myself a lot, which is even better. Um, and I haven't, I didn't know about the Persephone uh, story and the pomegranates, and I certainly haven't read the, the, the order, so uh, I'm going to do that. Thanks. Um, a comment, because you were speaking about uh, Rode and the promise of the blessed afterlife. And I was thinking that that, yeah, that may be so in Christianity, but it's not in, I mean, I'm not a rabbinical scholar, but um, it's not, it's not the case in Judaism, because in Judaism, hmm. um, there's a big, there's more of an affirmation of what we hear, have here in life. It's all about Lechaim. It's all about life. The, when we die is not so important. It's about what we do now. So I wondered how that played into Freud and everything else. <laughs> yeah, no, good, good, good clarification. It's um, it's 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 more Christianity and Platonism that has this preferred afterlife as the kind of aim and the goal. Um, but as Nietzsche points out. Christianity emerged out of later Judaism. So Nietzsche divides divides uh, the history of Judaism, the history of Israel into five stages, where each stage became more and more denaturalized than that previous. Um, and it was already a kind of denaturalized religion in a sense, because Yahweh is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of the gods of the Canaanite polytheism of, of the region that was taken to be the only one of a particular tribe. It's not as if the other gods didn't you know, didn't exist, as Lacan points out, is what's being said. It's just that you can't worship them in front of Yahweh. So, that, so it's a little bit like a, a, a tribe walking into ancient Greece and saying, okay, all these other gods, stuff them, we're just going to keep Zeus as the one father. So there's a sort of denaturalization going on there um, already. Uh, and then by the time you get to uh, later Judaism, I can go through the five stages, like uh, it's basically every time something goes wrong, uh, the, the, the priestly caste will come out and say, um, you're being punished for your, for, for your greed in the successful era. Yeah, so the great kingdom was a sin because you valued wealth and big palaces and, and might. And now you're being punished for that. You got to turn away from these, uh, you know, these earthly ambitions, and so we had a successive denaturalization going on as more and more misfortunes continue to befall them, which Freud discusses in Moses and Monotheism uh, too, which uh, Russell discussed I think last uh, seminar last year. So by the time you get to the prophet Isaiah, uh, Isaiah um, you got what Lacan in seminar seventeen calls Yahweh's ferocious ignorance, where any uh, religious practice that, that blends sexual knowledge in with nature itself is considered prostitution and he uses the hebraic word which is uh, um, zunim or znunim, zunim I, I don't know which one it is something like that 
um, it's prostitution. So um, basically anything like, for example, imagine a, temp imagine a temple to Aphrodite, prostitution. That's what, uh, that's what was going on. Imagine, imagine Dionysus, prostitution, right? So yeah, this sort of extreme turning away from sexual affirmation and articulation in the sort of uh, wider sense that was pre-existing. And uh, it's, it's one way of sort of defining why there is the real or something unarticulated because of this ferocious ignorance we insist on having towards our sexual nature. It all goes into the unconscious. Um, now, it was the, the Christians who then took this one step further through Paul with the afterlife fantasy. And this is what Nietzsche says, uh, you know, where did he get this idea from? He drew something out of late Judaism, maybe he got it from Plato, maybe he got it from the Egyptians. They had a fair afterlife system, right, with the mummies and the, and the giant pyramids. And Paul knew that with this uh, simple trick, he could conquer even Greece and Rome. He said, if you accept my, my story about Jesus' reincarnation, you get to go to a blessed afterlife when you die. If you don't, you burn in hell forever. So it wasn't just a blessed afterlife. It was like also avoiding the punishment of hell. So this was the Pauline kind of a twist that comes uh, later on in the tradition. So, yeah, so there already was some denaturalization in the Hebraic tradition from the start, but it wasn't to the extreme level of uh, Pauline Christianity. But even, even though you know, Jesus might not have had this afterlife uh, story to the extent that Paul did, there was still, as Nietzsche says, like a complete withdrawal from everything material from him. Everything's a signifier. There's, there's nothing material, um, you know, uh, love even your enemy, sex, you know, who has sex anymore? Like uh, uh, there's no sexuality. It's a completely sexualized, denaturalized uh, position, this love that emerges at the end. And uh, yeah, which then gets twisted or projected into the afterlife. So we spend our life renouncing the drives in order that we can one day be free and live in a happy afterlife. By the time we get to Christianity, which was also there in Plato. Can I say something? I just find it fascinating when you're referring to Judaism and you've got monotheism and then you go back down to Plato where it was a time of polytheism. It's just it seems to me with polytheism, it was actually, it's a, because it was many, many of the gods, it, it would actually can, can relate back to the drives and so forth. They're not so much um, repressed, would you say? But, but I, what I can't understand, it, it, yeah, it's, it's just this monotheism, because at the time when Plato was around, it was still very polytheistic. Um, so what was really going on? <laughs> Well, this is uh, what is discussed uh, at length in the first half of seminar eight, when Lacan decides I'm, I'm just going to spend the first half of this seminar close reading Plato's symposium, because you see what Plato does to the gods. He starts whitewashing him. You know, everyone's giving their speech on what is on what love is, and they're all trying to define the gods in a way that has them uh, renounce their former ways, where they will show sexuality and greed and passion and you know that's all being renounced. They're all becoming more and more peaceful because of this thing called love, which takes us up the ladder, up the Atima's ladder, right? right? Away from the real, away from the drives, away from nature, towards we finally end up uh, at the good, the supreme concept, which is pure, pure spirit, uh, the God, which caused, you know, it's the early, it's the monotheistic sort of um, turning platter, if you like, where all the mythological gods get subordinated to this pure spirit of the good, uh, up the top, oh, the, the, one. Of the good, yeah, the one, yeah, exactly. Which sometimes is Zeus, uh, uh, transforms Zeus, yeah, just, yeah. just as Athena becomes Mary in a <laughs> uh, tradition, yeah. Because Parthenon actually means virgin, so the Parthenon, you know, marbles Parthenon Athena oh. is the virgin because Athena was one of the virgin goddesses. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if every goddess had to be a uh, you know be like Aphrodite, but there was just a multiplicity. Mm. So Artemis and Athena were the two virgin goddesses but you know Artemis was still you know she was still shoot you if you did something wrong and <laughs> Athena well she had a very intimate uh relation with uh with people I um, including um, Odysseus in uh, in Homer's Odyssey yeah it's the intimate whispering she has with with uh Odysseus that enables him to get home and she from memory was also born from um a stray bit of ejaculate I think um all right 
yeah, one 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 god was trying to uh, claim one mortal, and actually, I think it was Hephaestus. Yeah, she wanted something from Hephaestus, and uh, Hephaestus said, "Okay, you're gonna have to give me something in return." And Athena kept it ambiguous, and when Hephaestus went to go, she kind of uh, you know dodged, and it landed on her tunic or whatever. So she threw, she flung it, and that landed. Uh, yeah. Okay, so she was already born by then, but that landed and became where Athens came from. Yeah, the one that was born from a stray ejaculate, I think, was Aphrodite from one of the castration um, myths. Right. Yeah, when yeah, Zeus. Yeah, how many so. Yeah, Zeus yeah. castrated Kronos, whatever, and the testy fell on the on the ocean, and out of the foam emerged Aphrodite, which means something like from the foam. Yeah. It's very real. The, the, the gods are very real. <laughs> See why Yahweh is getting ferocious, you know. And at all, you're all prostitutes. Maybe we're so, missing out on something. Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> um, yeah Jaya has asked a question. We're, yeah. we're really out of time, but this uh, should come in. Jaya, do you want to speak or will I just read out your question? You're welcome to talk to it. Uh, uh, before the question, I just wanted to say that there are lots and lots of stories like this in Hindu mythology. Uh, yeah, but I don't think it helps us very much in terms of attitudes or culturally in terms of sexuality. But um, in terms of uh, masochism, I was wondering, uh, because I'm constantly thinking about um, uh, perversion as a psychic structure, and what does that mean for masochism uh, in other uh, psychic structures? Uh, so uh, is how do we understand the masochism of a neurotic, for example? Uh, uh, yeah, and I'm particularly interested, you know, as somebody who's part of the BDSM community, recognizing that they're people of all different psychic structures playing with each other. And uh, so, so yeah, so, so how do we understand, is there anything common to masochism, whether it's being played out by, uh, you know, by a neurotic or a, uh, a, perver a pervert uh, is, is the question. And, and another question, if I may, is this difference between thinking and doing. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about play, because in BDSM, we talk about play, right? So that sort of in between, you're not just thinking it and you're not literally acting it out, but you're sort of enacting it uh, because you're, mm. you're playing it. So the, this binary of thinking and acting uh, doesn't really make that much sense to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's definitely not a binary. That's why I was uh, surprised to see Lacan, the late Lacan in Seminar 23, come back to that distinction between thinking and acting uh so so clearly which is why i stole it from uh from Jane's post i thought that's a good one so it's it's not a binary there's going to be zones of indiscernibility in between them uh, of course and then you know you could still say the play acting of bd s and m is still not actually acting it out you know pretending to to beat somebody is not actually beating somebody um although then again like you look at that um that james franco documentary i showed last week some of the practices get pretty extreme. Um, they don't look very aestheticized. So um, even within the BDSM community, you can get uh, different different uh, shades of investment, if you like. Um, the question of whether it's actual fetishism, I think we we sort of discussed this a little bit maybe a couple of weeks ago. Was um, uh, Fetishism seems to be, and, and the fetishistic process of disavowal seems more connected to the maternal phallus. So, for example, a male masochist who wants to be beaten by a mother surrogate might seem like the most fetishistic, whereas um, somebody who wants to be beaten by the father, um, it might not seem as much fetishistic. It might just be an, uh, a, a classic perversion, a masochistic perversion, guilt about the ancestral object choice, uh, regressing to a, or going back and, and incorporating some anal sadistic uh, pregenital material. Um, of course, we've got to look at the cases where people have experienced uh, violence or abuse in the in their past, which sometimes they have, and this is their way of mastering the experience by uh, play acting it out in uh, certain ways. And uh, also, why would you think that? Uh, I don't, actually, I'm not an expert on Hindu. Uh, mythology or Hindu um, polytheism, but why would you think, so maybe it's different in kind to Greek polytheism in some ways, but why would you think it's not very helpful to have 
a non-puritanical or non-puritanical religious structure in terms of you know, a child growing up and parents rearing their child to have yeah like the temples of uh but i talks about the, the temples of uh karnak or konorak where you've got the sort of sacred orgies happening like why wouldn't that be beneficial to sort of take away some of the shame to have sexuality included in what is diified or what is made of object why wouldn't, why wouldn't you think it would help us today well, well i don't know about the why but i just know that i mean in in my experience and what i see around me i, I there seems to be a complete disconnect you know, it doesn't matter that we have these temples. It doesn't matter about the Kama Sutra. I mean, you know, in terms of the the, uh, the sort of uh, negative attitudes around sex and sexuality. I, I I don't know. I mean, maybe the one good thing is that that uh, there's not so much guilt. Maybe there's more shame. Uh, maybe that's one kind of uh, distinction. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess there's there's a sense where how how sexualized is the investment of Hindu mythology today? Like, for example, once Plato became the dominant paradigm in ancient Greece, it was still polytheistic, as we're saying with Ross, but the gods were all suddenly reformed and made pure. And I was listening to one um, uh, Indian uh, politician activist speaking once on Australian television, uh, Shashi Thoreau, I think is, is his name, um, saying that with English uh, um, uh, colonization was introduced this Puritan structure into our world anyway. So that might have been where the Platonic twist happened or the Christian Platonic Puritan psychology entered into there as well. So there might be those temples on those pictures on the temple walls, or there might be the Kama Sutra, but who's really taking it seriously? You know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's like expecting an Orthodox Christian to take a Homer seriously, you know, or Dionysus seriously. It's just something in a museum. But today we've got the Puritan psychology. That's the, that's the sovereign good. Um, and, you know, that could still lead to a lot of the uh, sexual material being undiified, unaffirmed, unacknowledged, unsymbolized, um, yeah, to a certain extent anyway. Thank you, Jaya, and thank you, everybody. Way over time, <laughs> chock-a-block session as usual. Have a good week. The recording will come soon. See you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See ya.